So hey there fellow YouTubers. It's been a little while since I put out a video. I had a really bad sickness. I'm still at the tail end of it now. But uh, back out in the woods again. Feeling happy to be out here. It's nice to be out in the forest and the mountains and the fresh air and all that happiness. But uh, just gonna go into the location to set up camp. So I'm just gonna strap my bag up to the tree. Oh. I might sound a little winded in these videos, or this video. It's uh, This cold really took a battering on my lungs. Like I say, I'm still not 100% over it, so if you hear me coughing a bit in the video and stuff, sorry, but it is what it is, right? Like I say, just feeling stoked to be back out in the woods. <laughs> So I've got my standard six to eight foot length rope where I've got a loop in the one end. People that watch previous videos have seen this lots. Take that looped end, wrap it around the tree. I feed the tag end through, just pull it through and that way I'm cinched to the tree. I've got a stick just picked up off the forest floor and do a marlin spike hitch. strap that onto the tree. Now it gives me something to hang my bag off of. It's pretty moist out here, the area I'm in. It doesn't look like it's cold, but it's pretty freezing out right now. But there's always moisture in the land out here. I'm in a rainforest environment, so you can't really avoid the moisture. And it's good to get your stuff up off the ground as much as you can. I can see I'm getting a bit of mildew on the bag just from time and moisture in the, the environment. Even when I dry it out, it just keeps coming back. But uh, I'll have to spray that down again soon. But either way, just stop. Like I say, catch my breath here for a minute. And uh, hopefully I'll have a good show for you. Okay, so I've got to just improv a tripod for my camera. Get it up to eye height. So I'm just going to go through the forest. Given that the winter is kind of moved through, there's a lot of winter storms and stuff. I just got to find three straight stout sticks that are about six foot to eight foot in length. And I see one over there. So I'm just going to go grab those off the forest floor and then I'll come back, whip together my tripod, get the camera up and we'll start getting going fully. Okay, so I grabbed three sticks. I mean, when you're out in the wilderness, straight is a relative term, but uh, these ones seem firm enough where they're not just going to snap on me easily. It doesn't have to carry a huge amount of weight. Like I say, it's just carrying the GoPro. So I'm going to make them roughly the same length. Now, I've got a 24 inch length of rope that I've just tied a fisherman's knot into the end with. Maybe a close up of that. Like I say, nothing fancy. Just put a fisherman's knot in the end. So I double that up on itself. That way it's, you know, two. Take my three pieces of wood, lay them all side by each. In fact, I'll just put the big one in the middle. I just want to wrap that doubled up piece of cordage around all three of them. Set it in about five, six inches. And then take that middle stick and just start to turn it. I could have cleaned up that stick more, but whatever. I'm just going to turn it a couple times until it becomes taut. Gives me a basic tripod now. I've got something I can get the uh, camera up a little higher. And then that way it's closer to eye height. It's sitting on a little tripod, one of the small little, uh, I can't remember the name of them, Gorilla Grip or something. But uh, it's sitting on one of those little tripods. I just hooked that onto the top here. So I'll do that now. And that way, you guys, within reason, are up to eye height. Excellent. Okay, well I'll cut scenes and move on to the next part of the video now. So this is the uh, rough location where I'm going to set up my camp. I'm going to be down on the ground this time. 
I'm going to use this tree and this tree to do a ridge line between. But first off, I'm just going to kind of clear out some of the debris that exists on the forest floor here, just so that it's not uh, going to be digging into my back in the middle of the night when I put down my ground pad. And that. I really try to do minimal impact on the land as much as possible when I'm out in these environments. You know, there's some guys, they'll do YouTube videos that come out and they'll clear it right down to the dirt the entire way. Make sure there's not a spot or blemish on the land, if you will. I don't like doing that. It's really, in my perspective, not necessary if you're just going to be there for a night or two. As long as, you know, these little backbreakers, as long as you get rid of that kind of stuff, that it's out of the central area we're going to set up your shelter, it's normally adequate. And if anything, this moss and stuff that grows on the ground, I find adds a layer of padding so it makes it a little more comfortable. As long as you get the big chunks out of the way, you're normally good. I will clear out the area that I do a fire in because to me it's key that you don't have the heat of the fire start to create underground fires and work through root systems and those types of things. That's never safe. So I do tend to clean out those areas, but I try to make my environmental impact uh, as minimal as possible. So I'm just going to, like I say, clean out some of the small debris that's in this area, and then I'll cut scenes and come back and start to set up the shelter. So, like I say, I'll just pull out my ridge line. I got a hank. This is, I believe, about 50 foot of cordage. Just a normal 550 paracord. So I'll be using that for my ridge line. It's got some prussic loops and stuff tied onto this one. Most of my ridge lines have them. But I'll be using this to do the setup. So, with this ridge line, I've got a fairly large loop that I've tied into the one end of the line. And it's big enough where I can feed the hank of cordage directly through that loop. It just makes it really quick and easy when you go to strap onto the tree. So I'm going to go up just above head height. So this is all a quick release bundle. I'll just pull out some slack on that. I'll just set that there for a second. Walk around. Gonna get it up to a half decent height. And then like I say, I just feed the hank right through the eye and that way I'm onto the tree really easily. And because that's, you know, the hank is fed right through that loop, that's not going anywhere. It's on there good and firm. So I'll just run this over to the other side now. It's all a quick release bundle. So it allows me to just kind of keep it all up off the ground while I'm going. And you can see I've got these prussics that are already set on the line. I'll be using those later on. So the thinking really is I just want to get up to a nice good height. I'm well above head height here. I'll hook onto that just to kind of give me a leverage point. Now I want a bit of uh, slack in this rope. I'll switch camera angles and do a close up on the knot I'm going to do. Because this ridge line I don't necessarily want it to be super tight right off the bank. I want it to be loose and adjustable. So I'm going to use a modified pheromone hitch to do this end and I'll show close-up details of that. So given the angles I have to work with, this is going to be a little tricky, but it shouldn't be a major showstopper. So like I say, the main ridge line, I'm going to keep that a little slack. I don't need a lot of tension on that line right now. I'm going to take the other end, I'm going to put a loop on itself, and then I'm going to take that ridge line and I'm going to just wrap the loop on the inside and wrap it around three times. Then I'm going to take the tag end and I'm just going to feed that through the remaining loop as such, give it a bit of extra, and then I'm just going to kind of dress that knot up a bit. Now this knot starts to become almost like a prussic loop in the way it works. So I can slide this along the line to loosen or apply tension at will, and it'll just hold in whatever position I set it in. So I'll, I'll show that one more time just in case, so people don't have to go and rewind it. And the nice part is it's all quick release. So like I say, I take my um, tag end of the line, I'm gonna put just a loop into it, and kind of pinch that with my fingers. I'm going to take the ridge line itself and I'm just going to wrap the ridge line into itself three times. 
then I'm going to take the rest of the tag line and where that loop came through, I'm just going to feed it through and create a little bite there. And then, like I say, dress that knot up a bit. It looks like a bit of a fuddled mess when you first set it up, but this is one of my favorite knots. It's very effective. And like I say, it kind of lays like a prussic knot in the way it sits, and it acts like a prussic knot in the way that it'll kind of hold and apply tension along the line wherever you need it to be. So, and then normally, what I'll end up doing with that is I'll just take a stick, find a small stick here, hold on two seconds, just something to stop this loop from giving. So if I, because this is all quick release, if I pulled on the tag end of the line, that whole knot would come undone as you've just seen. But if I put in a little stick on there, it'll kind of lock that knot in place. And that way it just holds a little firmer. And like I say, it acts like a prusik loop now where I can slide it along this ridge line and wherever I stop it, it'll just hold the tension at that point. So one of the things I really like about this setup is the flexibility that it has. As you can see, there's no tension to this line really at all. So it allows it where if you wanted to turn around and do some fine tune adjustments, there's always little nubs on the tree. If I want to kind of lift this up a little higher and just kind of hook it on a few of the little nubs coming off the tree to kind of get it up a little higher when there's tension, it allows you to easily do that. And because I just have the loop that I fed the hank through on the other side, I can do that on that end as well. And really kind of fine tune exactly where I want it on the tree before I turn around and use this modified Fairmont hitch to apply tension. So exactly as I just mentioned, on this end where it was just the loop that I fed the hank through, it, there's no tension here either because there's slack in the ridge line. So if I want to kind of loosen this a bit and just shift it and adjust it to exactly how I want it to be, give me a little bit more height or lower it, raise or lower it at will, you know, I can do that with ease. I want this to be just a little bit higher. There's another little nub there, I can feel it. And like I say, still lots of slack on the line. And then I'll show you how easy it is to apply tension with that Fairmont hitch. I'll just switch camera angles here. So I just shifted my, I've got three prusiks on the line. Like I say, still totally slack. I pushed my prusik loops that they're a little further down on this end, just given the project that I'm wanting to do. But I'll come to this modified Fairmont hitch now and really, I'm just going to start sliding that along the line. And as I do such, it just starts applying tension to that ridge line. And I can get it really taut. Now that ridge line is amply well above my head. You know, it's well above my hand reach, really. But the thinking really is paracord, when you apply weight or tension to it, it'll have a bit of sag as I go through time. I'm going to use that to my advantage when I go to set up the shelter. So I wanted it up really high, but I know that it'll kind of droop down a little bit from the weight of things. And then I've got these two prusiks that I'll use for another part of the video coming up. But either way, my ridge line's up now. So for my tarps today, bit of a mess the way I've hooked that on, but whatever. For my tarps today, I'm using a, a 10 foot by 10 foot AquaQuest uh, tarp. And uh, I'm using an 8 by 10 tarp. So... The 10 by 10 tarp is what I'm going to use primarily for the shelter itself. So I'll just pull that out of the bag and start to do the shelter, yeah? So I'll just pull my uh, tarp out at this point. I think that's my square tarp, I do believe. We got a few different tarps, so. Yeah, yeah, we're good. I don't know if I've got the 8x10 with me, but this is my 10 by 10 tarp. So I'm going to turn around and there's a tie-up point right in the middle of the tarp here. I'll try to lay this out a bit while I explain it. I don't really need to have this laid out, but I just want to show you. 
that right in the center point there's a tie out on this tarp. I'm going to actually take off the one that's on here. I'll remove that and show you what I'm going to do. So I could have easily used the little setup I had on there, but take it off and walk through things and do stuff slightly different just so you guys can see the full details of it. So I've got another one of those 24 inch um, lengths of cordage that I've cut and just put a fisherman's knot in. I use these in lots of my videos. To me when doing bushcraft stuff, having those six to eight foot lengths of rope with a loop on one end and having these uh, loops of cordage they're invaluable when you're out in the field. It allows you to do a lot of different things. But I'm going to take that center um, tie-out point that I have in this tarp. I'm just going to take the loop now, pinch it. I'm going to feed it through and then just pull it back on itself. And that way I'm cinched onto there. That gives me kind of the loop now strapped to the tarp. And then what I'm going to end up doing, I'll just grab a small stick here. See if this, uh, that one's a little washy. Hold on. Yeah, this one's got a bit of bone to it. So now I'm going to take this loop. I'm going to kind of feed it onto itself and then pull it and pop it like that. I'm going to take the stick and I'm just going to feed that through. And that now allows me to have this stick as a toggle strapped onto the tarp. I'm going to hook that onto the prussic loop that's up on the ridge line to get it up off the ground. So like I say, now that I've got that toggle on the tarp, it's easy enough for me to just take the prussic that's sitting on my ridge line, feed that toggle through that prussic, make sure that it's sitting on the cordage and not on the wood itself. And I'm in essence strapped up here now. Now one of the reasons why I use this modified Fairmont hitch is I don't know exactly how high I'm going to want this to be. So if I need to bring this entire shelter down a little bit in height, um, I just loosen off the modified Fairmont hitch a little and it allows things to kind of set down. And if I need them to be a little higher, I'll apply a little more tension to the Fairmont hitch and everything will just kind of come back up again. But either way, this is kind of the first step in setting the shelter up. So as you can see on this tarp, I normally have my ridge line strapped on, or uh, tie out line strapped on to the tarp on the corners. So you can see one here, one here, one there and one there. I don't plan on using those in this, but I just normally have those tied on either way. What I'll be doing is I'll be pegging down from this corner. There's a tie out in one tie out. I'll be pegging that to the earth. And then there's a tie out in one from that side. And I'll be pegging that into the earth on the same side. And then I'll do the same exact thing on the opposite side. I'll do that in detail though. So on these 10 by 10 tarps, like I say, there's multiple tie outs along. This is the center point along that one side, but I'm only going to come to the one tie out that's in one from the corner. So I've grabbed a few of my tent pegs out of the bag there. I'm just going to slide the tent peg right into there, pull it out and set it into the earth. Uh, I don't want these in super firm right at the beginning because I might have to adjust them a little bit. I'm going to do the same on this side. I'm going to come in one tie out from this corner. I'm going to pull that and get it. And as I can see, I'm already a little high on the tarp. So the tarp will end up coming down, but that's okay. I'm going to feed my tent stake through the tie out. Make sure that that's pulled nice and taut to the other tie out. And I'm going to peg that down. The same exact thing that I'm doing here will end up being done on the other side of the tarp on the opposite side. So I'll flip camera angles and show you that too. So like I say, it'll be the exact same process on this side now. I'll just I'll throw that over there. I'll start off on this side. So there's my corner tie out. I'm going to come in one tie out point. Feed my tent peg through. Make sure that it's on there good. Now I'm going to pull that fairly tight now on opposite the one I did over on the other side. And like I say, just kind of set that in place. I'll come in one from this corner, pull that taut.
sent my tin peg into the tie out and I want that to be nice and tight to the other side so now it looks like it's kind of a weird shaped pyramid I'll just do a pan around of it to show you it'll all start to tighten up pretty quick you'll see okay so at this point in time like I said it kind of forms like a malformed pyramid of sorts it doesn't take much longer to get this shelter completed but kind of gives you an idea of what it should look like at this point and you kind of want this side to square up to this side and they say the shelter is about 90 percent there so i'll just kind of pan back but that's roughly what it should look like at this point so I'll show you the next step now. So now on this end where everything's kind of the collapsed pyramid if you will, one tie out in from the corner again, I'm going to grab that tie out and the same on the other side, I've got the tie out right here, I'm going to come in one from the corner, I'm going to take these two tie outs now, just grab my tent bag, I'm going to feed that through both of those tie outs make sure they're both on there good and solid and I'm going to pull that out and apply tension between the point where it's connected to the ridge line and the two tent pegs and just want to set that right in place now these two corner pieces where they haven't tied to anything I'm just going to take these and tuck them underneath and do the same on this side and now this exact same process I'll be doing on the other side so I'll just call it luck that the other side worked out as nicely as it did and everything came together tight but in reality what you might find is when you turn around and take these two you know, tie outs that are in one from the corner and you go to pull them out you might find that if you pull them out you can't seem to find a happy place between the two of them normally what that means is the tent pegs that are here or here are too close together so what you'll end up having to do is just turn around and make small adjustments now and say okay I'll pull this back out move it out a few inches and set it in tight again And see now when I grab these again and pull them out they seem to be a little tighter now everything comes a little more taut still a little bit of wiggle room there though it's not quite enough I see I can come out even more on this side so I will and you just kind of loose set them a little bit because you want to make sure you fine tune it to get it exactly the way you want it to be. So now, when I pull these out, kind of just hold them together. When I pull them out, everything seems to be pulling taut now. It all wants to square up and line to itself, which is exactly what you want. So I'll just grab another tent peg and tent peg down this end. But right before I do that, I want to show you one little thing that I do. So I take one of my loops of cordage and on one of these tie outs, I'm just going to hook on that loop of cordage exactly as I've done earlier or just kind of loop it on to itself but then I'm going to turn around and just make a small knot so that that loop isn't quite as big as it normally would be I really just want a small knot you know maybe two three times the size of your thumb so that the better part of that loop is still open and free and I'll use this now to hook the tent peg on and I'll show you why in a minute I just got the last tent peg now so the thinking really is that's one in from the corners just the same as it was in the back now that small loop that I put in I'm going to feed through that first and now I'll feed through the other tie out point I'm going to pull those out figure out where my happy place is 
I really normally do that by having the tie out start close to the ground. Now, the reason why I've turned around in here, I'll, I'll set this in a little deeper and then I'll switch angles so you can see exactly what I'm going to use this for. So I just drove that tent peg down a little tighter and it's got a little hook on it where it's just above the ground. Now the thinking really is, this is going to be my entrance that I use to get in and out of the shelter. So I can open this up, enter, and then turn around and close it back up and just hook that on and you can do this easy enough from the inside and everything's kind of battened down you'd end up tucking in these corner pieces that were not used and your shelter has now a closed door entrance that really this is really good in storm you know wet weather windy environments stormy conditions all around this shelter really is good at that given that it has the kind of six sides to it it deflects wind well it's low so you're you don't have to worry about the intensity of the wind wanting to blow things as much you know there's a little bit of imperfection given the that it's not as tight as could be because of this little latch but you know that's life right things uh things quite often aren't perfect you know, if I had it my way, I'd have a beautiful butterfly in my life, but these things don't happen in this season, right? But uh, needless to say, this added functionality, just like I said, it allows you to open up the door. I'll show it to you on a different angle where potentially if you wanted to open this up and have it in an open awning position, you could do that as well. Before I show you that open awning position, I'll just kind of do a quick walk around here and show you the look. It almost has a kind of a Lavu type look and feel to it. You know, and the amount of space on the inside is comparable to a Lavu. It's uh, just a lot less weight. But you could uh, easily have two people in here. I don't know if you'd fit your bags in with that, but... So needless to say, that's the kind of closed door configuration. This really is a great shelter for stormy weather and that type of stuff, but I'll shift camera angles here and I'll show you the open awning of what it would look like. I'm not going to set that up fully because I don't plan on using it in the open awning position, just for my own needs, but uh, I'll, I'll just kind of give you a quick reference of how you could do it. So if I just opened up the door, there's a tie out here. Potentially, I could tie down this corner i'm just kind of step on that with my foot to give you a little bit of reference and if i use two pegs with some sticks and that type of thing i could open this up into an open awning position and just leave it that way and it makes a very large shelter on the inside given that i'm only using a 10 by 10 tarp but like i say i think the rains are going to be coming down pretty heavy tonight and it'll be a little breezy so i'd rather just have it in the closed door configuration when i throw in the uh ground mat i'll show you how big that is on the inside because this can be deceiving this shelter looks like it's fairly small but it's actually a significant size on the inside when i put down the ground mat i'll show you the camera with the camera of exactly how much room a single ground mat takes up in here before i just go tossing in the sleeping bag but i, I really want to move on to the other parts of the projects that i want to show in this video so i won't spend too much time on that but either way i'll show you just for size bearing so like I say, I'll just pop off the ground mat, toss it in there, and let you guys see. I don't want to really throw the sleeping bag in there quite yet, but just in case there's any moisture gets on it, I want to hold off on having it exposed to the elements as much as possible, but I'll throw in the ground mat and you guys can see the size. I tossed in the ground mat. I'll just pop the door here. It's never elegant getting in and out of shelters on these GoPro cameras, but hopefully that gives you a bit of idea. Just kind of pulling it back like the awning was open. As you can see, there's cameras really not giving it justice. There's the one ground mat. I could easily have a second ground mat sitting here. There's definitely plenty of room for that. You know, there's uh, without an issue. There's a bit of that hang from where the fold is on the back. You could easily just kind of set that to the side so it's not, you know, touching anything, and I'll do that later on. But as you can see, 
you could fit in two people sleeping in here comfortably and potentially have, if you had two small to mid-sized bags, you could easily have those in here with you as well. You know, if you had two large bags, you probably wouldn't have the room, but it gives you an idea of the size and, you know, scale of how big this 10 by 10 tarp shelter can really be. So I'll just, like I say, shut the door again and kind of step back and, but there you have it. So I'll tuck this part back under again. But there you have it. You know, this shelter, like I said, it's a great little shelter when it comes to stormy conditions, wind and rain and that type of stuff. Uh, very low key. You know, if I was using dark colored ridge lines and that kind of stuff, my profile is very low to the ground. If this tarp was camouflaged, you barely even know I was out here. You know, it's, it's definitely one of the more covert ones that you can set up and has plenty of room. You know, for a single 10 by 10 shelter, you know, tarp to be a shelter for two people with bags is always a good thing, right? So I'll cut scenes here and start to move on to the next parts of the video. I'll just do one last quick pan around here. You know, if you had some ground sheets to go in there, definitely make a fairly bomb-proof shelter, if you will. So in one last comment I'll make about the shelter, you know, if you wanted to pull this out as well, you could potentially pull that out and peg it down, then it'll make things even more tight and rigid. You know, I'm expecting heavy rains tonight probably, but I'm not expecting heavy winds. If I knew that the winds were going to get really brutal, I would definitely pull these out and peg them down. They'll give you a bit more space on the inside and make things all the more rigid. But as it stands for now, I think I'm going to be okay with that at this point. Of And like I say, you just peg them down on both sides. This thing becomes rock solid. It's really a great shelter. Well, I'm stoked to get the shelter up already. It's always good. In the winter time, I'm up in uh, Canada. And in the winter time, we just don't get the sun hours. So when you want to do winter videos and kind of do a full camp and everything else, I really got to motor at a fair speed. Ah, damn, I got mildew into this too. Oh well. Everything will have to be sprayed down with anti-mildew, blah, blah, blah. But either way, I got the stool out, so it's good. So this is normally the point in the video where I'd stop and take a break. You now it's time for you guys to do some work. If you enjoy this type of content, you know, like, share, and subscribe, and that kind of thing if you could. I'm just going to stop for a few minutes and have some water and just take 5-10 minutes to relax. And then I'll get into the next part of the video, yeah? Well, I guess enough of taking a break and wandering around. It's time to get back to work. So for my next step, I've got a prusik here and a prusik up there on the ridge line. I'm just going to uh, use my poncho. I'm not going to bother with the 8x10 tarp. I did find it in my bag, but I'm just going to use uh, my poncho tarp that I have. Given how small the space is here, it seems to be a better fit for what I'm wanting to do. Okay, so I just pulled out my poncho tarp. Didn't bother showing all the details of me getting it out of its bag, but, you know, side issue stuff. But if you watch previous videos, I use this far more as a tarp than I do as a poncho in reality. And it just seems to be what it uh, works out to be a better tool for, for me normally. But uh, the same thinking I'm going to do... Uh, but I'm going to attach, uh, that I did earlier, I'm going to attach toggles onto these prosic loops and then just hook them through the tie-out points I have on the tarp and apply tension. So just as I did earlier, I'm going to take that loop, kind of fold it over onto itself, and then I'm going to twist it and pull those into those two inside pieces to kind of form a loop. It forms like a little lark's head knot. It's a really simple thing to do, but it just allows you to quickly and easily attach toggles onto your lines. 
And then on the tarp itself, I've got some tie-out lines, which I, I won't utilize, but they've already got little holes in them, if you will. So I'll just feed the toggle through those holes. Make sure that I'm sitting on the lines and not on the wood. And now I'm attached. It's really that simple. And you can slide these prussics along the line, and as soon as tension's applied, they'll lock. So they're handy in that regard. So on this side, I'll show a slightly different version of achieving the same result. So you can see the loop I have on my tie-out point here is pretty small. I'm not going to be able to fit a piece of wood through that. So easy enough to turn around and say, well, I'll feed the prussic through first without any wood on it, if you will. That way I'm kind of on. Now, exactly as I did before, turn around and set my loop, my lark's head knot, where I can attach that toggle and attach that on after the fact instead. And it allows it, one way or the other, I achieve the same result. So if you find that you don't have a lot of free space when it comes to the little loops or, you know, you're having a hard time getting the wood through, you don't necessarily need to. As long as it's big enough to feed the, the cordage through, you're laughing. So now I'll just slide out these prussics and apply tension to the tarp, and that way it's hooked onto the ridge line, taut, and then we'll just stake it out. As you can see, now that these are just, you know, toggle hooked on to the prussics, I can adjust these and set them exactly where I want them. Yeah. There's a level of flexibility if I wanted to shift it one way or the other. So it allows me to move this tarp. It allows me to move the position of this tarp back and forth on the ridge line. Now in this situation, I probably don't want it to be all the way up to the end here. So what I'm going to do is just kind of shift it back this way a little bit and then slide it back. And that way it kind of covers the entrance of the shelter a little bit as well, which I don't mind it doing. So needless to say, a really easy way to kind of hook a tarp onto your ridge line and have it where you can adjust the tarp and its positioning along that line without having to get into a lot of complex knots. I'll just make sure it's really taut because I like to have things that way. And other than that, now I just got to turn around and pull out my guy lines and peg those to the earth. Pulled out my tie out lines, guy lines. And my guy lines normally have prussics pre-attached to them. I like using prussics a lot, they're really handy knots. But for this, instead of even doing a tent peg, I'm just gonna take a stick that's, you know, kinda broken uneven, so it's already got a spike to it. I'm just gonna use that to drive into the earth. I'm gonna roughly figure out where it's gonna sit. See if I can find a soft enough piece of earth to dive into. Just drive that into the earth. And then I'm going to take the prussic that I have on this guy line. I'm just going to slide it down until I know that it's going to hook onto that stick. Set it on there and then just pull on the guy line and let the prussic take the tension. So I'll just end up doing exactly the same thing on the other side. When I pull out these lines, I want them to be on a 45 degree angle. I want them to have tension to the uh, tie out point on the ridge line across from them. And that way you've got a good taut set of the tarp. So needless to say, this is roughly where it's going to be. I'll just let that go slack. Drive my stick into the earth again. Ugh. Hook that prussic on to that stick and then just slide the prussic up that guy line. And just as fast as that, you've got a tarp up and running. So as you can see, it takes no time to get that set up. Now you can apply the same thinking to a larger tarp. It really is quite simple using those types of methods. I just want to have an area where if it does really start coming down, I've got a little a dry area that I can be in other than just in the shelter. So I didn't bother recording the full details of it, but just kind of cleared the earth a bit there for where my fire is going to go. I normally put the greens that came off the top, the mosses and that, 
I normally put those off to the side. When I go to leave in the morning tomorrow, I'll end up uh, making sure the fire's totally out and all that happiness, but I'll put all those greens back over top of this fire zone. And within a couple weeks, most of those mosses and that will just reground themselves back into the earth and there'll be minimal damage done to this area. So like I said, I really try to leave as small a footprint as possible. So when it comes to the cooking area, the fire lay area that I'm going to set up today, um, I'm, normally I would do the tripod like I showed earlier in the video. That is my tried and true method. But I understand when I'm doing videos, people want to see a variety of different things. So I'm going to do something a little different again today and uh, set that up. I, it's going to require some branches. I don't really trust the deadfall branches that are in this area, so I'm probably going to harvest some saplings. I'll bring you along and show you the kind of saplings I'm looking for. And, and the green wood I can just trust as being a little stronger. You know, when you're applying weight and tension to things and that kind of stuff, these dead woods, uh, they're okay for small diameter stuff, is okay for holding up cameras and that type of stuff. They weigh next to nothing. But if I'm hanging my uh, food with uh, liquids over the fire, I don't want to have it that uh, my cooked setup ends up giving in any way, shape, or form. So for me, green wood tends to be the safer option in that regard. I don't normally harvest it like I said. I'll normally use larger diameter uh, deadfall sticks and just make the tripod. But uh, I think this, uh, this cook setup will be interesting um, for people to see. So we'll go off and harvest some uh, greens and uh, we'll cut back to starting to get that together. So to give you an idea of the type of sapling that I'm looking for. So this has a diameter that's a little bigger than my thumb. You know, that's probably an ideal size for the task I'm looking at doing. And when I harvest these saplings, I don't necessarily want to take a main root that's coming right out of the ground. As you can see, this branch comes right off. It's not the main trunk. I'll leave the main trunk attached. I'll leave that one and take this one. It looks straight and it's, you know, got a good length to it. So hopefully I'll take two, maybe three to do the project needed. But I'll really try to find other ones like that where I'm not going to just kill the entire sapling or tree. No, I'll, I'll, you know, only take a piece of it. So I'm going to just use my silky folding saw. I'm going to try to take that as much as I can and bring it as flush to the base as I can. Okay, so I've harvested my green saplings now. Just going to clean them up a bit. I'm going to get all these stragglers off, you know, twigs and get them all off there as quick as I can. That way I'm left with just a nice straight pole with not too much sticking out of it. It starts to get thin down on the end. So. Once it gets below the, about the diameter of your thumb, it really starts to get too flimsy to use. You want stuff that's definitely thicker than your thumb. Okay, so now the smaller of the two poles just has a slightly smaller diameter, that's all. I want to get lengths that are about hip high, so just going to mark it.
I'm going to want three pieces that are about the same length. So as you can see, they sit about hip high, and this one can be a little bit more freeform, it's okay. If I wanted to get picky about it, take off the thin part of it, and I'll bring it to about there. Just uh, Like I say, that one's not as worrisome. I think it doesn't have to be quite as strong. And this one I'll just leave as such for right now. So now out of these three sticks, the larger diameter, the two ones that have the larger diameters are the ones I'm gonna go, wanna go with. And I'm gonna start with the small diameter faced away from me. And I wanna 45 this the best I can. Just so it's on the angle. I'll even clean that up a bit and thin it down. This is going to be driven into the earth, so I want to have it kind of on the 45 so it's just easier to go into the ground. Now this one already had a split to it. I'll use that to my advantage. You can say I just want to kind of thin them off a bit. I know I'm using a machete to do it, but it's not the most elegant <laughs> tool to use, but it'll, it'll do the job, right? So just to give me some sharper points on the ends. I'll even do this one a little bit more. Just makes going into the earth easier. And now with the other one, the smaller of the three, as long as I got squared ends, I'm okay with it. Okay, so I've got those three sticks we just processed a bit there. And I scored myself with just a rock that was sitting in the surrounding area. Now I went and grabbed two more loops out of my bag. I'll be using those in this project. So we've got the small diameter stick. It's gonna be a cross piece. And the ones with the 45s, we want the pointy bits facing away so they're not connecting. Now this, is going to be just like it was with the tripod pretty well where I'm going to take these loops double them up on themselves I'm going to first take two the two pieces of wood the small cross piece and then I'm going to start to just turn this and I'm going to keep doing it over and over again until that starts to really bunch up And it's starting to become tighter now. And I want that fairly close to the top. You see? It's just fast lashed together now. I'll do the exact same thing over on this side. Where I want to make sure that my 45 degree angle piece is the one facing away. I'm going to take... I'll just set that down for a second. Take my other loop. Double it up on itself. Hook them around both. Now I'm going to take the piece that's on this side that isn't the cross piece, the one that's going to go into the earth, and I'll just start wrapping it now. Do the exact same thing. And just keep twisting it and twisting it until it all of a sudden becomes tight. You'll feel the tension start to grow. And it's a way to quickly give me a cross beam without having to get into complicated knots. And if I pull this back out of the ground later, I'll be able to recover my cordage easily. So, I'm going to want to have this close to the fire but not right on top of it just kind of roughly set it in place and I'm just going to take that stone and drive it into the earth oh. and 
make sure it's really quite firm into the ground. You don't want this thing giving on you in any way. Right now I can put a half decent amount of load on it already. Put a little further down, just to be cautious. Make sure your stick is fairly level. This side can go down a little bit more and you're golden. So now with this other sapling, I'm gonna come in. I don't need them to be as long as hip high now. So I need two pieces and they've gotta be, mm, say a foot and a half, two foot in length. So, and I want them cut on the 45 just the same as we did previously. So I'll set the wood on the 45. I'll find a good cut point. That looks good right there. And there's my one branch. I'll clean that up in a second. Take roughly the same length again. Right at that knot. Now this one I want to cut straight across because I've already got the 45 on this end. Now I'm just going to clean up those 45s just like we did with the larger pieces. Just to make it a little easier to go into the earth, right? They look all right. I'll even take that off a little bit more. Perfect. That'll do. And now we've got all the pieces together that we're going to need. I might have to cut the longer piece down a little bit, but we'll see as we go. Okay, so now with these two pieces, step back a bit. I've already marked the spot roughly where I'm going to be putting these. But so I've got those two sticks now where I've cut the 45s on both ends, just like we did previously. Now these, I want to face the 45s together with each other. And I'm going to do the exact same thing with the loops. I'm going to double that loop up on itself, wrap it around the end, and then start twisting one of them. And keep twisting and twisting until it gets taut. That's starting to get really tight now. So now what I want to do is, like I say, I've marked roughly where the spot's going to be. So I'm going to turn around and set this and just drive these into the ground as a little triangle. And they're squared up with the post and the fire. Okay, and they're kind of held now. It's in there pretty firm. So the thinking really will be now, I've got my main beam is going to be able to fit through there and onto the fire where we're going to carry our pot. And this can be adjusted a little bit back and forth where if the weight of the pot starts to pull down, the little triangle in the back will help stop the stick from flipping and going into the fire. So it gives you an ability to adjust on and off the fire this way as well. So now the only real last step is to push it back as far as it'll possibly go and then figure out where the outside edge of this fire is going to be, which is right about there. So I know that I'm going to have to take off about about a foot or so from this stick. I'll just mark it so I know where I got to clean it up. And then the thinking really will be, I'm going to walk down this with my saw now and put little marks every couple inches along so I can adjust where the pot is hanging off this pole. You'll see as we go. Find that spot where I marked and just clean that up there. That should be okay. And then like I say, I just want to kind of walk along this now and put a few V notches into it. Just to give me a bit of adjustability later on. If I need it.
And these aren't fancy. It's really just putting small divots into the wood to give me a place where that paracord can bite into without slipping down the piece, uh, slipping down the stick. Maybe one or two more. Perfect. I always get picky. I know later on, sometimes the paracord has a really tight bite into it. I like it to be loose and easy. But that's pretty well it for the stick now. Like I said, we've got a bit more rope craft that we'll do to get the pot hung over. Other than that, our cook setup's gonna be almost ready to go. Okay, so you can see now the rough setup of things. I'll end up hanging my grill off of these notch points and then I can shift this pole left and right to move it in or out of the fire as I wish. And then down on this end, like I say, that little triangle opening now just kind of locks this other side of the wood and that way it's not going anywhere it won't lift even if it's got good weight onto it so as you can see the fast lashing makes it simple but if you've watched previous videos of mine you'll see that even though we're utilizing the fast lashing which i always find is handy i try to use that for as much as i possibly can the flexibility of this setup still it requires a little more cordage than a tripod would and it doesn't have the up and down. I've got the back and forth and the left and right to be able to kind of shift my setup. But I still don't like how I don't have the up and down control like I would with the tripod. You know, of the tripod to me, that's one of the reasons why it is my tried and true method of it really does solve the problems. But, you know, I want to show alternative ways to do things. You can easily put a bit of paracord onto here and just hang a toggle with a marlin spike hitch to hold the bottle over the flame. I'll, I'll probably just stop and do an example of that. I don't plan on harvesting off wood. I'm going to go back out to my vehicle and grab some wood that I have. So I figured I'd just show kind of an example of hanging the water bottle off of this setup. So I just got my you know, clean canteen and a small stick. That stick, it's width is you know about the same maybe a little bit smaller than the can itself so i've got two of my trusty pieces of loop you know cordage that's tied in loops i'm just going to take one wrap it around the other and then feed it back through itself so that they kind of cinch onto each other first off and then as i showed earlier in the video i'm just going to take it fold it over on itself reach inside pull on those two strands and kind of create a little loop and that creates my lark's head where I can slip my stick on and just kind of cinch those loops onto that stick. So now when it comes to my clean canteen bottle, I'll pop the lid off. If I turn around and take this stick now and just drop it into the can and make sure that it's kind of inside it'll now hook onto the walls of the can because the lip is smaller and now i'm able to just turn around and hang this over the fire and i can adjust where over the fire it sits by moving it to these different points if i wanted it kind of closer you can see there's a little bit of a lack of adjustability like I say, when it comes to the up and down, but if you didn't want it to be that close to the flame, because that was actually sitting fairly low, it's easy enough to just turn around and say, all right, let's pop that stick back out of there, loosen up that one loop so that we can free everything up so that the loops are free from each other. I'm back to a single loop now with that toggle still on there and just use that on the setup instead where like I say it's able to have a little bit more height so depending on how many 
loops you use, you could adjust your height that way. And potentially the further out on the stick you go, you're going to be a couple inches higher or lower over that flame, depending on where the flame is positioned. So and if you've watched previous videos of mine, when it comes to bushcraft stuff, I have a grill that I normally use. I find it to be my preferred method. I'll just hang that over the fire. So this is made out of a 9 inch cookie sheet, a cookie cooling rack. And then I've got some fishing swivels on there with some O-rings and a bit of chain. And then it goes into more O-rings, fishing swivels, and then some more O-rings. And it just makes it that this unit can turn and spin and move around. And even the chains themselves, I can twist any given one of these chains as much as I want. And it doesn't bunch up the, the grill. It makes it still sit flat. No. I can see, though, the moisture has been rough over this uh, last couple months. Given the amount of rain and stuff we had, I'm probably going to have to replace this grill soon. I'm starting to see a bit of rust into it, but, you know, such is life, right? But either way, I'll normally use that and then, I think I already put my water bottle back in the bag, but I'll normally just set my water bottle right onto that. I'll just grab it. And in this kind of configuration I should be able to be right at the right height above the fire where you know I'm not expecting the fire to be huge so I, I normally only keep a fire going just enough to cook food I don't even normally use fire you know some people when they go camping and that kind of stuff they'll burn a campfire for hours and hours and hours I'm not like that normally I'll burn a, a fire for two three hours tops and then that's it I, I let her go I just don't want to waste the resources so one of the gains of having this little cross bar set up if you will I don't know what to call it exactly but it's the best name I know for it is just like I've been showing over and over again in this video where I take a loop of cordage fold it over on itself reach in and a pop up opening sit in my toggle and then turn around and Lark's head this setup onto this stick and now it gives me a place where potentially I can hang my water bottle keep it up off the floor you know I've shown this in previous videos where you could have multiple things strung up in this way if you had a crossbar you can hang all sorts of different pots pans whatever as long as there's a little opening that you can stick the sticks through and you're normally gold. So now because the earth is really wet here in the location I'm in, I put down a layer of sticks that were about as dry as can be. I took some of the green sticks, they were the drier ones, and put them down as well. It's not normally ideal to use green wood obviously when it comes to getting the fire going, but the sheer moisture that exists within the environment I'm in now I've got to get up off that wet earth. It'll just suck the heat out of the flame before it even gets a chance to get going. So I put that down. I've got to gather up some twigs and that kind of stuff. I've already gone to the truck and picked up some larger wood. I'll probably baton a bit of that down to have small kindling. And uh, hopefully I'll get the fire going soon, yeah? Okay. So I'm going to get the fire going now. So I've got... Uh, in previous videos I made jute twine fire starter where it's wax and coated jute twine so I just got a piece here uh, I've kind of pre-fluffed but in essence just kind of rip apart all the fibers loosen it up I want it to be really lots of fine fibers that the ferro rod spark can get access to and now this is a little bit of cedar bark that I have it was in my bag it's old so I don't know how many vol or how much volatile oils it's got left in it anymore but we'll give it a shot right so
the moisture out here is just brutal. Nothing really wants to take. Even the, even the fire starters just don't want to hold. Everything's just soaking wet. You don't even see the moisture. The smoke wants to hold to the ground even. And you can see by the amount of white smoke, everything's just soaking wet out here. It's really, really difficult to get fires going in this time of year. There's been winter storms that have come through and just everything's just saturated with moisture. You know, the ground, the wood, the everything, you name it. It makes it really, really difficult. But you just got to try to dry stuff out the best you can as the fire builds. That's really the biggest secret when you're in rainforest stuff. And you really just hope that the larger dry woods that you do have manage to take before the uh, smaller kindling um, goes. That's what I'm banking on at this point. <laughs> And like I say, I'm using fire starters and everything in there of wax and jute twine and stuff, but all the wood that I use for the fine twigs and branches are off deadfall trees that are in this area, and they were just soaking wet, you know? You really just gotta hope that your kindling dries them out fast enough. Or your fire starter, I mean, dries them out fast enough. really try to build my teepees almost uh, straight up and down as much as I can just to uh, let the heat rise up through the wood right so I'll just kind of let that go for a second now hopefully the wood dries out enough to start to take flame it looks like it's starting to it's always a good sign but you can see a lot of that smaller branches underneath that normally should be 
dry kindling never took. It's sitting down there drying out still. Yeah, it looks like it's starting to build strength now. That's good. So and as you can see, the fire is starting to come up now. Got a few pieces of fuel wood on there. I really just want that to try to take as much as I can. Even still, as the fire is growing, you can see a bunch of small twigs and stuff underneath that are just not going. They're just too wet to even take flame. So hopefully they all just kind of dry out and this just keeps building. I'll keep a close eye on it. Like I say, I want to just get up into those three pieces of fuel wood I have. They're not huge piles, but it's enough where I should be able to, once this kind of strengthens a bit, which it looks like it's doing, I should be able to kind of uh, have it settle down a little bit and just boil off some water for my noodles. All right, well, I managed to get the larger fuel wood on. And like I said, I don't have a large supply of wood this time, so I'm just going to get my water on, try to get that to a boil as quick as I can. I just want to get some food into me. I'm getting hungry and I'm feeling faded still. This sickness is making me that I'm not at 100%. So hey there fellow YouTubers, Frank Bush here again. Thanks for tuning in to another one of my bushcraft adventures. I hope you like the uh, tarp shelter here, that setup. You know, this cook setup isn't really my favorite, but the fast lashing stuff I think is interesting. You know, it's always good to have those kind of skill sets given the simplicity of them. Just to know uh, how to do those when you're out in the field they can be invaluable for not necessarily setting up these cooking things. I'd rather do tripods, like I say, but uh, for if you want to put together primitive traps and you know, those types of things really quickly, um, using fast lashing is really an invaluable skill set to have. But uh, I hope you enjoy this type of content. If you do, please like, share, and subscribe. Thanks for watching. Cheers.